for today, our discussion will be about the introduction to cell and molecular biology. So the discovery of cells actually started with the invention of the microscope by the English micropist Robert Hooke. Um, in his age of 27, he became already the curator of the Royal Society of London, which is um, England's foremost scientific academy. So the discovery of the cells was actually just because of a question on why cork stoppers could hold air in a bottle so effectively. So what he did was to describe the chambers that he found on corks or from the part of the bark of a tree. So he sliced the cork and found these cells, which he associated with rooms where monks live in a monastery and a honeycomb. He also observed empty cell walls of dead plant tissues, wherein the walls had originally been produced by the living cells that they have surrounded. So in the image that you see here on the screen right now, this was actually one of Robert Hooke's most ornate compound double lens microscopes that were initially used in discovering these um, cells or um, smaller particles under the microscope. So moving on, we also have Anton van Leeuwenhoek, which is a Dutch seller of clothes and buttons. So apart from this daily job that he has, when he has this spare time, he tried to improve the quality of microscopes during these times by grinding different lenses. So he actually uplifted or... Um, you know, improve the quality of how microscopes could actually magnify objects. So with this one, he was the first one to describe um, living single cells and his resu uh, results were actually checked and confirmed by Hooke himself. Okay? So for about 50 years, he sent letters to the Royal Society of London describing his own microscopic observations as well. So Anton van Leeuwenhoek was actually one also of the main contributors about, you know, um, giving more evidences about the cells. And then um, with one of his experiments using pond water, so he dropped um, pond water on the slide and saw this moving living cells. So he compared these cells um, to moving animals, so he called it animal cues. Okay. And um, another important contribution also of Anton van Leeuwenhoek is actually the description of different forms of bacteria from simple experiments we had, like um, those peppers that are soaked in water, and from the scrapings of his teeth. So in the 1830s, this was actually the most important time where cells were realized to be very important and led to the formulation of the cell theory. So the pioneers of the cell theory were actually um, in collaboration of these first two um, biologists or philosophers who are Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann. So Matthias Schleiden is actually a German lawyer turned into botanist and he realized that despite differences in tissue structures, all plant tissues were made of cells and that plant embryos arise from single cell. On the other hand, Theodor Schwann, a German zoologist, realized cellular basis of animal life and concluded that plants and animals are similar in structures. Um, hence, Schwann then propo uh, proposed the first two tenets of what we call now the um, cell theory. However, the Schleiden and Schwann view of cell origin was less insightful for some other philosophers and even biologists studying um, the uh, cells. So they felt cells could arise from non-cellular materials and then eventually disproved by others as well. So it took really a long time for them to be able to identify how this cells or how they can formulate theories um, to support how cells are being um, reproduced or how they do develop. 
So one important um, contribution as well in the formation of the cell theory is the conclusion made by Rudolf Virchow, um, a German pathologist, and made a good case for and added the third tenet of the cell theory derived from his cell division observations, and it ran counter to Schleiden's one view of the cell region origins. So basically, the cell theory stated that first, all organisms are composed of one or more cells. Second, the cell is a structural unit of life. And third is that cells can arise only by division from a pre-existing cell. So again, the first two points of this cell theory were formulated by Schleiden and Schwann, while the third one was actually a contribution by Virchow. So all of the ideas that they have put together was able to uh, form this what we call now the cell theory. So basically, this is what you call the classical cell theory. Okay. So, for the basic properties of cell, number one, it has life. So, life is the most basic property of cells and they are the smallest units to exhibit this property. So, both plant or animal cells can be removed from organism and cultured in laboratory where they will grow and reproduce for extended periods of time. So, apparently, if these cells um, are actually mistreated, they can die. Okay, so death can also be considered one of the most basic properties of life because um, only a living entity faces this case. So the first cell culture was actually done by George and Martha Gay of Johns Hopkins University in 1951 from the donor Henrietta Lacks. So uh, what they actually got from Henrietta Lacks was actually... Um, or pioneered the study of cancer cells. So they got malignant tumors, uh, the malignant tumor that she had, hence they named it the Hela cells, which are being used today for research purposes all around the world. Okay, so the picture that you see here on your screen right now is actually how a cancer cell looks like. So basically, these Hela cells, they have been cultured by different um you know, different laboratories and has been a very use, uh, useful tool uh, for them to be able to find answers on how to cure cancer, okay? So the next one would be cells are highly complex and organized. So how do we say that they are highly complex and organized? So basically complexity in terms of order and consistency. So the more complex a structure, the greater the number of parts that's, that must be in their proper place and the less to tolerance of errors in the nature and interactions of the parts and the more regulation or control that must be exerted to maintain the system. So basically, cells do have this what you call um, organelles that do actually help when it comes to processing different um, activities inside the cell which are very, very useful when it comes to, of course, the growth and development of a certain organism. Okay, so the third one or the third property would be cells possess genetic program and the means to use it as a blueprint. So it's because of the encoded um, collection of genes. So in this one, um, this encoded collection of genes are actually constructed by your DNA. So genes are actually storage lockers of information for constructing cellular structures, direction for activities, and programs for self-reproduction. So once a gene have alterations, it will result to mutations that will lead to vari variations among individuals and changes in the biological evolution of species. So, again, when you say blueprint, you know, the characteristics and even the um, DNA content of a certain species can be um, copied to or can be um, sent to a daughter cell or a daughter organism wherein they will be having the same characteristics and features. But then again, if there will be alterations, manipulations, 
um, abnormalities that can be or that can affect the formation of the DNA in your body, of course, there will be chances that um, differences in characteristics or maybe abnormalities may also arise in a new form of organism. Okay? So, next property would be um, the cells are capable of reproducing more of themselves or their variants. So, the reproduction process of um, these cells can be in two forms. It can be through mitosis and the second one would be through meiosis. Okay? So, mitosis is actually the generation of somatic cells in the body that are the precursors of the different cells of the body. Usually, they depict phenotypic characters, for example, um, the generation of your muscle cells, your nervous tissues, or your red blood cells or blood cells in your body. Okay? So for meiosis, this is the process being used to form the gametic cells or your sex cells. So eggs for the females and then sperm for the males. So basically, these processes allow passing of genetic information or material to your daughter cells. Okay? So the next property would be the capability of cells to acquire and use energy to develop and maintain complexity. So with this, this is usually due to the contribution of sun for plants for them to be able to um, produce food for themselves through the process of photosynthesis. And for animals, um, through respiration and usually energy is often generated from the environment like the, um, you know, the input or intake of sugar and glucose. So once this glucose or sugar is already synthesized in the body, it will eventually produce ATP or adenosine triphosphate, which is the product being utilized in the cell. Hence, with the presence of ATP, it is called the energy currency of the cell. Okay, so all of the processes that um, the organelles do within the cell do actually require ATP. Okay? So the next one is that cells carry out variety of chemical reactions. So the sum of the chemical reactions in the cell is what you call metabolism. And for this um, chemical reactions to be done in a manner that um, this is it, it's not it's not it's not too slow or too fast you have what you call your enzymes. So basically with the presence of enzymes, they greatly affect the rate of chemical reactions in your cells. Okay? And then cells are engaged in numerous mechanical activities based on dynamic mechanical changes in cell like transportation of materials, structure assembly and disassembly many of which are initiated by changes in the shape of, of your motor proteins, which actually require constant energy to keep working. So cells are able to respond to stimuli whether organisms are uni or multicellular. This is because these organisms do have what you call the receptors. So these receptors sense environment and initiate responses. May it be moving away from an object in path or towards a nutrient source. So these receptors can be actually hormones, growth factors, and extracellular materials as well as substances from neighboring cells. So these pathways can make or break the cell's metabolic activities. Okay? So, next one is that cells are capable of self-regulation. So, they have this characteristic of robustness because they are protected from dangerous fluctuations in, in composition and behavior. So, the cell has always a way to return to its normal condition in normal phases with the use of specific feedback circuits. This is to return to... And the goal is actually to return to homeostasis or balance. So if self-regulation is not working well, it may result to a debilitating mutation or a breakdown in a cell's growth. Okay? So the next one would be cells are prone to mutation and damage. Okay? 
So one example would be the experiment conducted by Hans Drasch about separating the first two or four cells in a sea urchin embryo. As you see here in the picture on the screen, so in normal development, no, from a fertilized egg, and then once it undergoes um, the blastulation process, the gastrulation process, and then the growth and development, it would actually result to a normal sea urchin. But if there are, um, you know, instances wherein there could trigger mutation and damage, of course, the resulting product of, or the resulting organism of um, such um, mutations or experiments would actually be different from what is expected. So, in this um, experiment, as you see here, what um, Drish did was from the fertilized egg, okay, what he did was after the egg has already been, um, you know, producing these blastula cells, he separated them, okay? So, he, ma he made sure that those, uh, the two cells that has been separated would actually thrive independently. So, what happened after the experiment is that, yes, it did produce the same sea urchin, sea urchin but the problem is that there's already a difference in size okay so again when there's mutation or damage in cells there can always be um you know a defining characteristic that can be seen once the cell actually de uh, develops and grows okay so next, growth and development begins with the fusion of sex cells. Okay, so this um, actually is because when the fusion of the sex cells happen, that's the start already of fertilization process. So from fertilization, the egg would develop by itself. It will become a blastula and then a gastrula and then Definitely, cells would do differentiation and would undergo growth and development, okay? So, for some animals, like amphibians, they, when you say in the developmental phase, they still do um, undergo metamorphosis. But for animals that do no longer undergo metamorphosis, of course, the development is um, straightforward, okay? So, next, the fundamentally different classes of cells. So, with the advent of extracellular membrane, two basic classes of cell walls were distinguished by size and types of internal structures, or what you call your organelles. So, it exhibited a large fundamental evolutionary discontinuity, and there are no known intermediates. So, the two different classes of cells are what you call now your prokaryotes and your eukaryotes. Okay, so they were differentiated based on, um, of course, their extracellular membrane and their internal structures or, or organelles. So when you say prokaryotes, these are, um, it under it is all the bacteria, the cyanobacteria or the blue-green algae, and by the description itself, they are just structurally um, simpler. And not sure when prokary prokaryotic cells first appeared on Earth. And then you have the eukaryotes, so they are more structurally complex, like your protists, fungi, the plants, and the animals. So this is, uh, or these are the images, or uh, for you to be able to co compare your prokaryotes and your eukaryotes. So in here, you will see a diagram of a generalized bacteria so it has a capsule that surrounds or covers the inside of the cell and then it has a plasma membrane it has a cell wall the dna uh, is in the form of nucleoid it has a ribosome so the ribosomes are actually responsible for um synthesizing your proteins they do have the pilus 
they do have the cytoplasm and the bacterial flagella or flagellum. Okay? And then in this one, you will see now a eukaryote, which is the plant cell. Okay? So, if you compare the bacterial cell and the plant cell, they actually share some, um, you know, similarities in their organelles. So, for example, the cell wall. So, cell wall is also found um, in your plant cell. So, it your plant cell does have also your cytoplasm and, of course, it also has a nucleus, okay? But the difference with the nucleus is that the nucleus is um, covered or enveloped and then it has a nucleoplasm and a nucleolus. But in a bacteria, it's, um, it's, it's on a nucleoid form, okay? Linear nucleoid form. But in plant cell, it's circular. Okay? And then you see that when bacteria does have a flagellum, a plant cell doesn't have. Okay? So those are just simple um, comparisons that you may see when it comes to bacteria and the plant cell. So even if we have uh, plant cell as a eukaryote, we also have the animal cell, which is more likely more complex than the bacteria in the plant cell. Okay, so with um, the animal cell, there are also differences between the plant and the animal cell. So basically, um, animal cells doesn't have the cell wall. Okay, but it has um, the cytoskeleton, it has a plasma membrane, Okay, for its um, for its components. So basically, um, animal cell are more complex than the first two images that I have showed you. So similarities between prokaryotes and eukaryotes reflect the fact that eukaryotes almost certainly evolved from prokaryotic ancestors. So, first one, both types of cell and code genetic information in DNA using an identical genetic code. Second, both types of cells share a common set of metabolic pathways such as glycolysis, TCA cycle, or the Krebs cycle. And the next, both types of cells share common structural features. Similarly constructed plasma membrane that serves as selective permeable barrier and cell walls with the same function but different structure. They also have similar mechanisms for transcription and translation of genetic information, so including similar ribosomes. So as you see, as what I have um explained to you a while ago there are ribosomes in bacteria and then there are ribosomes also with your animal or eukaryotic cells okay so basically it's very important that um you know that ribosomes are the ones synthesizing proteins which are needed when it comes to the generation of your genetic information so those proteins are very, very important when it comes to the formation of your genes. And then, similar apparatus for conservation of chemical energy is ATP, which are located in the plasma membrane of prokaryotes and mitochondrial membrane of the eukaryotes. Okay? So they do have the same energy currency. And then, similar mechanisms of photosynthesis. So, again, between cyanobacteria and the green plants. So, that's also how they um, get their, um, their energy for food production. And then, similar mechanisms for synthesizing and inserting membrane proteins. So, with membrane proteins, these are the proteins that you see in the plasma membrane of your um, organism and then this um, membrane proteins do actually help when it comes to the regulation of um, products that go, that goes in and out of the cell and even um, 
a force from what I've told you um, earlier with the mechanical um, circuits, okay, of your, uh, of the cells, okay. And then proteosomes, these are protein digesting structures of similar construction between RK bacteria and the eukaryotes. So, there are also characteristics that distinguish prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Hence, eukaryotic cells are much more complex internally, may it be structurally and functionally, than prokaryotes. So, eukaryotes have membrane-bound nucleus with nuclear envelope containing complex pore structures in other organelles. It's, uh, it divides eukaryotic cells into nucleus and the cytoplasm. While in prokaryotes, they contain relatively small amounts of DNA, around 600,000 base pairs only, to nearly 8 million base pairs, and around 0 uh, 0 0.225 to 3 millimeters in size, and has 8 million base pair equals DNA molecule nearly 3 millimeters long. So, if you compare your eukaryotes with prokaryotes based on the base pairs, more likely eukaryotes do have much longer DNA sequences and more base pairs compared to your prokaryotes. Okay. So eukaryotic chromosomes are numerous. Unlike the prokaryotes, they contain linear DNA tightly associated with proteins to form a complex nucleoprotein material known as your chromatin. Okay, so again, um, prokaryotes do have a linear DNA. Okay? And then eukaryotes contain an array of complex membranous and um, membrane-bound organelles that divide the cytoplasm into compartments within which specialized activities take place. And then eukaryotes have much or has many membrane-bound structures while prokaryotes mostly devoid of them except for encoded bacterial mesosomes and cyanobacteria photosynthetic membranes. So no mitosis or meiosis in prokaryotes. However, their mode of reproduction is through binary fission. So when you say binary fission, they just divide into two. So whatever it is, that you find from the other is also present from the other one. So it's not it's not so much um, complex than the process of um, eukaryotes when it comes to reproduction. And then prokaryotes pr proliferate faster, so they can double in 20 to 40 minutes, and they can exchange genetic information via con conjugation only. Okay, so for uh, if conjugation is being used for prokaryotes, of course, for eukaryotes, we use what you call meiosis and exchange of uh, genetic material or genetic information happens when um, there's already the fusion of um, the maternal and the paternal DNA. Okay. So next, eukaryotes have more complex locomotor mechanisms than prokaryotes. And then eukaryotes have complex cytoskeletal system including microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. And associated motor proteins, while prokaryotes do not have such a system. So a body of or the body of a prokaryote is very, very basic compared to the cytoskeleton of a eukaryote. Next, um, Eukaryotic cells are capable of ingesting fluid and particle material by an enclosure with plasma membrane vesicles. So, again, there are different modes of how um, cells do actually get their food. It can be through endocytosis or phagocytosis. Okay? And then... Eukaryotes have cellulose um, containing cell walls in plants. And then eukaryotes have two copies of each gene per cell. So that's what you call diploidy. 
one from each parent with sexual reproduction requiring males and fertilization, unlike binary fission in prokaryotes. Okay, so from what I have explained earlier, what you can see from one prokaryote when it divides through binary fission, you can also find it to another prokaryote or the daughter cell of a prokaryote. And then, eukaryotes possess three different RNA synthesizing enzymes or RNA polymerases. Okay? So, for further information about the comparisons of the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, you can check on Table 1.1 from your ebook to be able to know those comparisons um, between the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. So, types of the prokaryotic cells, they are actually divided into two major taxonomic groups or domains. First one is the archaea or the archaea bacteria, and the second one is the bacteria or the eubacteria. So, the domain archaea includes archaeans or archaea bacteria, which are thought to include our closest living prokaryotic ancestors. So, there are several groups of organisms whose evolutionary ties to one another are revealed by similarities in their nucleotide sequences. So, basically, um, you know guys, when you compare organisms with one another, we, you have actually, or the primitive ways, or the older ways of doing it is just by using phenotypic or characteristics that can be seen by the naked eye. But however, with the uh, use of molecular techniques, we can now already compare different organisms using your nucleotide sequences or your DNA sequences. Okay? So if, for example, you compare an organism from another, the only characteristics that you can see by the eyes, for example, the color of the hair, the skin, color, um, the height, uh, those are just, or, or you know, those characteristics are actually limited. But when you come across to molecular techniques, you can actually compare characteristics at, as much as 1,000 or 2,000 base pairs. Okay? So, more likely, you know, the advancement in research and science and the usage of molecular um, techniques has actually changed the course of, um, you know, ch checking on the evolutionary um, relationships of each individual. May it be from plants, from animals, or from this bacteria and archaea domains. Okay? So, best known archaeans that live in, ex are, do actually live in extremely inhospitable environments. So, they are actually what you call extremophiles and they include the following. So, you have the methanogens which are capable of converting carbon dioxide and hydrogen gases into methane, methane gas. And then you have the halophiles the, which are the prokaryotes that live in extremely salty environments like the Dead Sea or certain deep sea basins that possess a salinity equivalent to 5 moles Magnesium chloride. And then you also have the acidophiles. These are the prokaryotes who are acid loving and that thrives at pH as low as zero, such as that found in the drainage fluids of abandoned mine shafts. So those are the different types of your extremophiles. And then the thermophiles is our prokaryotes that live at very high temperatures, including what you call the hyperthermophiles. So they live in hydrothermal vents of ocean floors. And the latest record holder in group is actually they, what they call the strain one to one, since it, since it is able to grow and divide in superheated water at 121 degrees Celsius. So imagine they can still thrive even if it's more than already um, the boiling point of water. Okay, so 121 degrees is the temperature used to sterilize surgical and laboratory equipment in an autoclave. So that's the typical setting. 
okay? But for this strain 1 to 1, they could go as high as 121 degrees and they can still reproduce themselves. Next, the domain bacteria or eubacteria. So these are um, composed of all other prokaryotes other than the archaeans. So bacteria are present in every conceivable habitat on Earth, from the permanent Antarctic ice shelf to the driest African deserts to internal confines of plants and animals to rock layers several kilometers below the surface. So an example of your bacteria would be the mycoplasm or the mycoplasma. These are the smallest living cells around 0.2 micrometers in diameter only. And they are the only known prokaryotes to lack a cell wall and to contain a genome with as few as 500 genes only. Okay. And then you also have the cyanobacteria or formerly known as the blue-green algae which are the most complex prokaryotes. So the members of the cyanobacteria are very similar to the photosynthetic membranes present within the chloroplast of plant cells. As in eukaryotic plants, photosynthesis in cyanobacteria is accomplished by splitting water molecules which releases molecular oxygen. So many cyanobacteria are capable not only of photosynthesis but is also um, you know capable of nitrogen fixation the conversion of nitrogen gas into reduced forms of nitrogen such as ammonia that can be used by cells in the synthesis of nitrogen containing organic compounds including amino acids and nucleotides okay so those species are capable are again capable of both uh, photosynthesis and nitrogen fixation and they can survive on the various resources such as light, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and even water. So next, let's um, talk about the different types of eukaryotic cells. So in many ways, the most complex eukaryotic cells are among the single-celled unicellular protists. So what are these protists? So the protists are actually um, can or can be classified as autotrophic or heterotrophic. So this protist, um, when you say autotrophic, these are protists that can produce its own food using light, water, carbon dioxide, and other chemicals, while heterotrophic protists are organisms that eat other plants or animals as their source of energy and nutrients. So, multicellular organisms actually exhibit differentiation and development, okay, as what I have been telling you um, on this lecture. It's because of the embryonic stem cells that differentiate into various cell types with specialized functions, okay? So, um, stem cells can also be called as germ cells. So, this stem cells can differentiate or is actually considered to be a general type of cell, okay? But this general type of cells, once they thrive and they, you know, differentiate to what type of specific cell they would need to be uh, with the with the presence of the you know the instructions given by your um, the cells in your body they can be uh, generated or they can be part of different systems of your body so for example these stem cells could be bundles of your nerve cells they can be con uh, they can develop into red blood cells they can be smooth muscles, they can be your fats, intestinal epithelial cells, created muscles. It can be or it can make up your bone tissues and of course your loose connective tissue with fibroblasts. So basically, if you're being asked if what would be the precursor of your uh, or what would be the initial type of cell being produced in your body to be able to produce such specific um, cells, you call them stem cells or germ cells. So one example of multicellularity and differentiation would be the cellular slime mold, Dictyostelium, that shows the following advantages. 
So during most of its life, they are independent amoebas and each cell is a complete self-sufficient organism craw crawling over substratum. But if food gets scarce, they stream toward each other and form slug-like aggregates or what you call the pseudoplasmodium or slug. So the cells of slug are no longer a homogeneous population and soon slug stops moving, rounds up on substratum and extends upward in air as an elongated sporangium or a fruiting body. So with such um, capability of, you know, um, having cells to be, um, to, to, you know, cells to differentiate, to accommodate a certain situation. So that's how some organisms do actually grow and develop. So basically, not all organisms do have the same flow or the same pattern of growth and development. Of course, there are also, um, you know, you should also consider environmental factors, okay? So for such, um, for, for example, the, uh, the, the life of dictyostelium, so if food gets scarce, of course, their cells do actually differentiate into a slug-like aggregate for them to be able to survive, okay? So in such animals also happen, so especially with evolution, uh, of course, if there would the, if there's um, a need, of course, of a of an of of a certain organism to um, to adjust, okay, to be able to survive, they it would actually do it, okay. So next differentiation, this is actually the process by which a relatively unspecialized cell becomes highly specialized. So slime mold amoeba has two alternate paths of differentiation available to it as it enters the aggregation stage. So in many regards, the most complex eukaryotic cells are not inside plants or animals, but rather among unicellular proteins. So differentiation of each eukaryotic cell depends on its genetic blueprint that responds to signals and um, that are being received from the environment. Despite differences, all cells of a multicellular plant or animal made of similar organelles. The number, appearance, and location of various organelles can be correlated with activities of particular cell type. Okay. So cell and molecular biology research focuses on representative or model organisms. So it is hoped that a comprehensive body of knowledge built on these studies will provide framework to understand those basic processes that are shared by most organisms, especially humans. So in the course of um, understanding, you know, and developing um, biological researches, there, ha there were six model organisms that were utilized, so one prokaryote and five eukaryotes. So each one has specific advantages that make a particularly useful as a research subject for answering certain types of questions. So of course, if um, you know when you say model organisms, these are organisms that can be you know that can be easily utilized or that can easily be reproduced for research studies. Unlike if subjects are humans, of course that would be a different thing because you know we also have what you call the bioethics of using you know live um, subjects to be able to be used in research um, endeavors okay so the model organisms are as follows first we have the escherichia coli or the E. coli, it is a rod-shaped bacterium that lives in the digestive tract of humans and other mammals. So much of base, uh, the basic molecular bio biology of cells first worked out in E. coli. So for example, how does it replicate, how does transcription happens, and how translation happens. Okay. 
And then next, we have this saro, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It is more commonly known as baker's yeast or brewer's yeast. It is least complex of all eukaryotes commonly studied, yet it contains surprising number of proteins that are homologous to proteins in human cells. Such proteins typically have conserved functions in two organisms. The species has a small genome encoding about 6,200 proteins, and it can be grown in a haploid stage. When you say haploid stage, one copy of each gene per cell rather than two in, a, in most of your eukaryotic cells. And it can be grown under either aerobic, so when you say aerobic, oxygen containing, or anaerobic, so ibig sabihin, it da, or it, it means it doesn't have, or there's no presence of oxygen um, under conditions. Okay, So it is ideal for the identification of genes through the use of mutants. Next, we have the Arabidopsis thaliana. This is a member of the genus mustard plants. It has an unusual small genome of 120 million base pairs for a flowering plant. So it is a weed called the thalicres. And apart from having the unusual small genome, it actually has a rapid generation time and large seed production and it grows to a height of only few inches. Next is the Cynorabdis elegans, a microscopic size nematode. It consists of a defined number of cells, roughly around 1,000 only, each of which develops according to a precise pattern of cell divisions. So the animal is easily cultured, can be kept alive in a frozen state, has a transparent body wall, a short generation time, and facility for gen genetic analysis. Next is the Drosophila melanogaster or the fruit fly. It is a small but complex eukaryote that is readily cultured in the lab where it grows from an egg to an adult in a matter of days. Drosophila has been a favored animal for the study of genetics, the molecular biology of development, and the neurological basis of simple behavior. So certain larval cells have giant chromosomes whose individual genes can be identified for studies of the evolution and gene expression. So in the mutant fly, um, you know, so in a mutant fly, there's actually a leg that has been developed where an antenna would be located in a normal wild type fly. And then you have the mus musculus or a mouse, typical lab mouse. This is the common house mouse and is easily kept and bred in the laboratory. Thousands of different genetic strains have been developed and many of which are stored simply as frozen embryos due to lack of space to house the adult animals. So these are the images of um, the last four model types okay, that are being used for, um, uh, for, for the development okay, of certain organisms. So the sizes and cells and their components. So basically units of linear measure of uh, most often used to describe cell structures. So we use micrometers and nanometers. Okay. And then you also use angstroms, often used by molecular biologists for anatomic dimensions. So approximately one angstrom is roughly the diameter of your hydrogen atom. So the image that you see here on your right is a table showing the relative sizes of cells and the cell components. So sizes of cells uh, and their components 
um, we have here some examples of the dimensions of cells and their cell components. So a typical globular protein or myoglobin is around 4.5 nanometers by 3.5 nanometers by 2.5 nanometers. So you also have your highly elongated proteins over 100 nanometers in length. The DNA is approximately 2 nanometers in width. The large molecular complexes like ribosomes, microtubules, and microfilaments are 5 to 25 nanometers in diameter. And cells and organelles are more easily measured in micrometers like the nuclei and the bacteria. Next would be about viruses. So viruses are pathogens that are smaller and presumably simpler than the smallest bacteria. So basically in the late 1800s or specifically during um, the time of 1892, we have Dmitry Ivanovsky, a Russian biologist, forced the sap from a deceased plant through filters whose pores were so small that they retarded the passage of smallest known bacterium. The filtrate was still ineffective and he concluded that certain diseases were caused by pathogens that were even smaller and presumably simpler than the smallest known bacteria. And these pathogens became known as viruses. Then when Del Stanley at, in 1935 actually um, made an experiment about the tobacco mosaic virus, which is responsible for the tobacco mosaic disease, which is a rod-shaped particle that was crystallized and found to be ineffective, thought to be a protein. And then viruses are responsible for many human diseases. Some cancers come in different shapes, sizes, and construct constructions like the COVID-19, HIV, AIDS, polio, influenza, cold sores, measles, cervical cancer, and hepatitis B. So common virus properties are not considered living since it's, it needs a host to reproduce and metabolize. So viruses are all obligatory intracellular parasites, so it means that they must reproduce in a host cell. May it be plant, animal, or bacteria, and depending on specific virus. They are macromolecular aggregates and inanimate particles. Outside of living cell, it exits as particle or virion, essentially a macromolecular package. So the genetic material of a virion is surrounded by a protein capsule called capsid, usually made up of specific number of subunits which are efficient um, and need only a few genes to make up a capsid. Okay, so especially now in the times of the pandemic, of course, we all know about COVID-19, right? So the COVID-19 is a type of virus wherein it actually thrives with, um, with of course, a host, okay? Definitely, the COVID-19 was theorized to, to have originated from an animal lab from China and then eventually... From that laboratory, it, it you know it mutated and be, be, became um, a threat to humans. Okay, so basically, these viruses also mutate depending on what type of host cell they can affect. Of course, if this certain virus can no longer um, reproduce or can no longer land a potent host cell, what they tend to do is to mutate to be able to survive okay so this that, that is actually the problem that we are facing with covid since the virus itself is finding human host cells to reproduce and to be infected if people will not actually um abide laws about you no know, social distancing and um you know will not stop um, the presence of people in, you know, open areas, there's really a big chance that these types of viruses would mutate to be able to infect another person. So if you're already familiar, we already have different types of um, COVID-19 viruses. We, also, we already have the UK types. We also have like a South Asian type of 
um, virus, so they are already, you know, the viruses are already mutating. Okay, because of course the goal of a certain virus is to be able to survive and thrive. Okay. So, um, how does a virus or how does the tobacco mosaic virus look like? So, this is actually an image or the model of a portion of a TMV particle or the to tobacco mosaic virus. So, there are actually what you call the protein subunits which are identical along with the entire rod-shaped particle and enclose a single helical RNA molecule. So this is the RNA and then the protein coat is outside. So that's how it looks like it's in a helical position or in a, a helical um, orientation. So next, um, many animal viruses have capsids around by lipid containing outer envelope derived from modified host cell membranes as virus buds from host cell surface, for example, HIV. And then bacterial viruses like your bacteriophages are among the most complex. Examples could be teeth bacteriophages which have polyhedral heads that contain the DNA and then cylindrical stalk that injects DNA into bacterium and a tail fiber that attaches to the bacteria. So basically, that's how a bacterial or a bacteriophage look like. And then viruses have surface proteins that bind to particular host cell surface component, which is actually what you call specificity. So of course, to be able to bind to a particular host cells, these viruses, you know, are host specific. Okay, so it can be an animal, it can be humans, it can be bacteria. Okay. And then, most viruses have relatively narrow host range, wherein certain cells of certain hosts like human cold and influenza viruses are only able to infect human respiratory epithelium cells. Okay. So, this is actually how the virus diversity looks like. So, structure A is an adenovirus. That's uh, how it looks like. B is a human immunodeficiency virus or the HIV. As you see, it has good proteins, the RNA inside, it has a reverse transcriptase and a bilipid layer. And then lastly, the um, fig figure C is a T, even bacteriophage. So that's what you see, the polyhedral head. You have the protein coat, and then the, you have the nucleic acid inside, and then, of course, the spindles, okay? And then the body that's, uh, that will, you know, inject the virus. So, viroids. T.O. Daner, in 1971, discovered an agent causing potato spindle tuber disease, wherein potatoes get gnarled or cracked and viruses are not the simplest types of infective agents. So the infectious agents was small circular RNA totally lacking a protein called a uh, coat he called a viroid or viroid. So the traits of a viroid includes the following. So viroid RNAs range from about 240 to 600 nucleotides, about 10% size of a smaller virus. There is no evidence that viroid RNA codes for proteins. Any biochemical activities in which they engage take place using host cell proteins and enzyme completely. For example, duplication of viroid RNA in infected cells use host RNA polymerase 2, which normally transcribes host DNA into messenger RNAs. And then many cause disease by interfering with cells' normal path of gene expression. Like for example, they monopolize RNA polymerase 2 to duplicate viroid RNA. So for more information about um, chapter 1, which were not included in this lecture, please um, read your book. The Cell and Molecular Biology Concepts and Experiments by CARP et al. 2015.
So if you have any questions, please let me know and send me a message for further clarifications. Thank you very much for listening and have a nice day.